And if you thought Joe was going to do this show intro, then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. And the Doom Hammer is in house. I am Joe. That is Dan. That is Jeff. That is Buddy. What is up, everybody? And by everybody, I mean every buddy. Buddy. Hey, buddy. Hey. Hey, man. Hey, What's hey, up, hey. yo? Not, not a lot's up. Um, beers are up. Downloads are up, right? Can yeah. I get a hand clap? Yeah. Wow. Woo-hoo. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's been fun. It has been fun. We've uh, we we we've we we finally broken uh, the barrier. And um, what is the barrier? The barrier for me was 500 downloads, and I think we're at like what 851. Oh, at this we point? we blew through that. Yeah. Props to uh, James Rolfe and uh, to Joshua James Toomey. Rolf, Joshua Toomey, who we had last week. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that was just, that was awesome, dude. Um, we got to talk with him for, we had to talk about new metal for a while. So we got that out of our system and, uh, and we found out how much that Dan loves Lump Biscuit. No, we did not. We found out how much, (laughs) we found out how much Mr. Toomey likes. Oh, that's right. I remember when I first got into new metal, like that used to be my thing was Lint Biscuit. And I used to walk around like a giant idiot, being like, "Oh, I give this band the Limp Biscuit seal of approval." Oh, I remember. Yeah. Oh, oh god. It was bad. Thank God I Shoot wasn't there now, for that. Shoot me now, please. I don't want to relive that. But you know, things have gotten better. Um, we started listening to stuff like In Flames and Extol and Fuck yeah. Living Sacrifice and Opeth and Mastodon and all that good stuff. It's about to get moderately thrash in here. I'd also like Thrash-y. to point out this is the first Deathy. episode we've done with four hosts in house so this is going to be chaotic to edit but i'm up for the challenge if you guys are up for the conversation i guess so man yeah absolutely yeah normally i'm in tennessee so this is special for me to be able to be here with everybody we actually sent jeff on a motorcycle to pick buddy up put him in the back of a u-haul don't ask questions and he is here now i've got a couple what did you fucking call a Moped a motorcycle because it was a fucking moped, man. I, I was trying to give Fuck you props, you. but you know, you you you're the one that degraded it down so to wait, a moped. Uh, oh, so you're on a moped hauling yeah, a U-Haul? Yeah. Well, he's trying to tell me it was a motorcycle, and I'm like, dude, it's a fucking moped. <laughs> and before we get into in flames, I'm gonna go right ahead and say thank you to everyone for listening to this podcast. We are on Google Play. We are on iTunes. We are on Stitcher. We are on TuneIn Radio. So if you have an Amazon Echo product, you can say to it, Alexa, play the latest episode of Discography Discussion, and she will. You can also follow us on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. We love hearing from you guys, and if you are wanting to know what's going on with us, you can find everything at DiscussMetal.com. We've actually got a Patreon going, so Patreon.com forward slash Discuss Metal. Give me your money! That's what he said. (laughs) And now back to you, Dan. I don't think it was ever me to begin with. Uh, (laughs) We just assumed it was you. Hey, I'm the host of the show, okay? God Um, damn it! Right. (laughs) Sergeant Slaughter. Um, Ooh, no, okay. So really? in flames, right? Uh, Fuck yeah, man. This is this is our bucket list. This is one of the bands that we had to talk about. Yeah, we had to. We just never. We just wanted to find a special enough night to do it. And when Buddy said, "Hey, I'm going to be in town this night," we were like, "All right, we're going to do it." Yeah, this band is one of my formative. Like when I first started getting into like death metal and you know that kind of stuff. Uh, this was one of the first bands I picked up. And I've been addicted to these guys ever since. Man, you're not um, the only one. They're formative for me too, man. Yeah, me, me three, uh, for sure. Um, I'm here too, guys. Yeah, yeah, Joe's you're here four. too. Uh, but the, you know, so <laughs> the thing is within Flames is, hey kids, you like death metal? Yeah, I love death metal. Do you like death metal that is rooted in traditional heavy metal? Uh, I guess. No, trust me, just listen to it. It's great. Um, so you've got all the heaviness of death metal within Flames. Especially early in Flames, you, um, I, I would say you can trace the melodic death metal thing back to, I guess, Carcass on their uh, Heartwork album was a very melodic death metal record, and you can hear a lot of that in um, in In Flames. And one of the things I like is that Heartwork really, um, 
it incorporated a lot of uh, a lot of melodic influences into kind of Carcass's grind death metal sound. Yeah. Um, like, Heartwork was '93, right? I believe so. Yeah, and so In Flames had started in 94, so it's very close. Pretty close, yeah. So, like, a lot of the bands, so there was a town in Sweden called Gothenburg. (laughs) And uh, there was something in the water in Gothenburg, Sweden, because three bands emerged seemingly out of nowhere. Uh, And they were called In Flames, Dark Tranquility, and At the Gates. At the Gates took the more brutal side of it. Our tranquility and in flames more or less played a very similar style of melodic, melodic. death metal but oh my god like even i mean dark tranquility which is going to be another episode um it better oh it will be, <laughs> trust me uh those guys are still kicking ass um in the and playing you know the the similar style what um, are you implying there well as <laughs> as, as, we, as we'll get into later um in flames um for a little while, um, I would say, you know, later in their career, kind of stopped carrying the melodic death metal torch, so yeah. to speak. Which is okay, as long as is it is it okay? Yeah, not- I mean, I mean, I'll say it's okay because one of my all time favorite bands is Catatonia, and they went from holy shit, fucking awesome, to like, hey, I can chill to this. I like Catatonia. I like all their stuff. I do too, but I'm just saying that there's a there was a market switch, but I think the difference is the. Well, I we'll, feel we'll, like, we'll get to that yeah, whenever we'll get it's to time. That. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We have here. some arguments for this. Oh, fuck yeah, we do. So, yeah. so we talked about get pissed. We talked about death being the originators of death metal. Yes. Whether or not they were the origin of that style. Oh, I thought it was crutch. Well damn. <laughs> you, you think everything's crutch, I think, lately sometimes. I love me some crutch. Everybody loves them. You know, some thank crutch. God Dan does not have a because <laughs> holy shit, does he have a <laughs> All the fucking time. High five. Now I'm gonna have to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to edit that out. Oh, sorry, man. Uh, so, is In Flames the band that popularized melodic metal? And I don't mean melodic death metal because they kind of went into that and then they kind of leveled out at melodic metal. No, Joe. The answer to that is Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden. <laughs> I thought that was melodic thrash metal, but. Well, no, you know, we just said no. melodic metal. So I'm, if I were I'm, you, Joe, I'm, I would edit that statement out of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> As Iron Maiden is, has never been, nor will ever be, thrash metal. Uh, very uh, well, very well. Yeah. However, uh, okay, so In Flames definitely popularized the idea of melodic death metal. Yeah. Um, there was nobody really at that time that was doing melodic death metal like they were. Except Dark Tranquility, who was essentially doing the same thing, but for whatever reason did not become as popular as In Flames, at least not right away. I would say I would say now Dark Tranquility is probably um, higher 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 up in the hearts of metalheads than In Flames is. But you go back to albums, you go back to albums like The Gesture Race and Horacle and Colony. Oh, um, you know. And I think I think at that time the bands at, at very worst were equal. You know, um, I don't think that I don't think that Dark Tranquility had the ups and the downs that uh, In Flames had. So, what was the first album of In Flames that you heard? Oh, that I heard uh, probably was um, okay. So when I was in when I was a freshman in high school, I had. Uh, I met some dudes on a cruise ship that I was on with my family, and they showed me Colony, and I hated it because I listened to new metal at that time, and yeah. I, I didn't care for it. Uh, however, uh, whenever I really got serious about listening to In Flames, it was because Buddy had seen a video for Cloud Connected, Cloud Connected oh, yeah. on Headbangers yeah. Ball. Yeah, I was sitting in my room one night. And I saw it come on, and it was uh, one of their only videos because they've not had many music videos, and for it was for Cloud Connected. And I was like, "This is amazing! I have to go find this now." And I went to uh, I went to one of the CD shops in town and picked it up. And then I picked you up from high school that day, and we just yes. blasted Trigger. I'm yes. like, "You have to listen to this! This is amazing!" I think like a lot of people in America with the new metal scene were introduced to In Flames with that record. Uh, Reroute to Remain. Which um, makes sense, because, I mean, around that time, you know, music videos were still, like, the, the thing to do. Right, yeah, know? it was still cool. And, yeah. I guess that would have been, like, what, around 2000 and 
two, two or so. Yeah, two. Like, that's when that came out. Yeah. So I mean, I really uh, that record really connected with me. I know, I know, Buddy bought it, um, and then um, I got it shortly after. And I mean, I remember that record just blowing me away because it was so heavy. Because I think at that time we were like we were really into metalcore and stuff, and uh, and that wasn't that different actually. Uh, we we discovered kind of you know, and we really discovered it later in that a lot of the metalcore that we liked. It actually was very like unabashedly ripping off of In Flames. Yeah, but yeah, it, Flames, wasn't, it wasn't even derivative. It, like you said, it it's was the just same like, riffs. Like, yeah, exactly. Like we used to when we would listen to an Azalea Dying record, we'd be like, "Dude, In Flames called. They want their riffs back." You know, yeah. <laughs> like, but In Flames did it better. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Kill Switch Engage too. They uh, on their first album, they ripped a lot of In Flames out of it. Um, yeah, they've been. Yeah, they were pretty much unabashed about it. Whenever. Oh they, yeah. They. I mean, they pretty much straight up admitted, "Hey." But that's, I mean, that's cool. I mean, I guess uh, whenever you're copying and emulating, that's the greatest form of flattery, so why not? Sure. Yeah. So did everybody rip off As I Lay Dying then, or did they rip off In Flames? Everybody ripped ripped off off of As I Lay Dying who ripped off of In Flames. Yeah, because they definitely got more popular than In Flames did in Well, you mean in the States, yes, but... Yeah, in the States. I mean, you go over to Europe and in Japan and South America... Completely different story, right? And would you guys say probably that In Flames and uh, Dark Tranquility were like the Metallica Megadeth of Sweden? Uh, yeah, probably. You know, yeah, they, they were. Uh, yeah, because there's a lot of you know, you know, interconnection. There. There's a lot of you know, front. You know, they grew up together in Gothenburg. You know, right? Th- they were actually in a lot of bands together. Uh, I mean, I, I guess we'll probably get to that point. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. talk about that. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of. Uh, I mean, I don't know if they still hang out. I don't know if they're still friends, but I I do know that when they were younger, that you know, they were all in the same venues. They were a lot yep. in the same bands, yeah. and I um, think that's kind of cool. That the fact that you had this, what Gothenburg's like fifty thousand people. I mean, it's a tiny freaking town. Yeah, it's not a huge town. Yeah. yeah, and like we have like an entire genre to 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 thank for it. it comes from this one little fucking hole in the wall and yeah. it's fucking awesome it's, well, right. it's the black sabbath syndrome and the beatles syndrome you had this little area that just started right one thing that everybody latched onto. yeah and speaking of like you know just the interconnection part like we're currently i don't know if you've played any clips yet joe but we're listening to in uh jester race and or not just race i'm sorry lunar strain yeah lunar, lunar strain and, uh, <laughs> and so lunar strain um has actually Michael Stani of Dark, Tran- Dark Tranquility on the album doing all the vocals. Right, and you know who was the vocalist yeah, for a- uh, Dark Tranquility at that time? Yeah. Anders Friedland. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> it's like they yeah. went to a bar one night and they got drunk and then went and they went home with different singers and didn't realize it until the next morning right. and they were already on tour and went, oh, oh we'll okay, just go, I guess we'll, we'll just stick go with this. It. Hey, well, actually, you're not that other guy. You're the other guy. Well, for the, for the reality portion of it... Uh, <laughs> Michael Stani was all was always a studio. A, yeah, he was uh, a studio vocalist. Correct. Them. He was a he was a stand in musician. So he did, was never. Did, did we have the the te- melodic death metal wasn't version? Part of the band. Right. Did we What's, have the melodic death metal version of Millie Vanilli then? No. Thank, no. Thank God. They because because sang. Millie Millie Vanilli recorded a different band and then lip synced to, to their it. stuff. You know what's funny so is it's not the, not really the same. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm kind of I'm a bit older that I actually bought the Millie Vanilli Jeff is a professional I am older person. Yeah, Yeah, that's because that's technically true in this room, so (laughs) I'm just going to go with it, so fuck you. (laughs) No. But uh, it's... Get off my lawn! Yeah! (laughs) They actually make good music whenever they were actually not being, you know, being lip sync. I mean, if you're into the you know... I got indie indie pop. I just got one question for you. Why the fuck am I listening to indie pop? No. Are they screaming? No. Then I ain't tapping my feet. Oh, see, <laughs> I, I have an eclectic taste, so I mean, I even like you know, rockabilly and you know, old school country. So I, I'm, all brutal I'm, I'm, all the time. All no. right, let's get back on Lunar Strain. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Lunar Strain, right, comes out in 1994 with uh, Michael Stani uh, as the lead vocalist, uh, at least as a session musician. And uh, oh my goodness, right? Like so, behind space kicks in, and um. You know, we're somewhere else at this point. We're not in Heartwork. We're not. Uh, 
we're we're somewhere else, you know. Like, and what's the first time I heard this, I kind of thought like, man, it doesn't really sound like In Flames. Um, it almost sounds black metal ish uh, in, in, in the way it sounds with the, with the, with the screeching vocals and, and and all that. But it's not really black metal because um, uh, controversial statement. It's too good. Uh, <laughs> oh, but, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, I uh, I really I was really drawn to that song behind space, which was the opening song. Um, I love uh, Michael Stani's rasping, screeching vocals. Um, it just really cements the brutality of that song. Uh, all the songs on this record are about space, which is awesome. Um, I, I don't have a lot of bad things to say about Lunar Strain, other than the fact that it sounds a little thin. Here's More the thing, beer. Here's More the beer thing, for Dan. Here's the thing about Lunar Strain. This is the one album in their discography that to me it, it sounds like somebody was listening to death and they were just trying to make an album that they liked but it didn't quite yet sound like in flames because what we got later even one album later on the jester race was the the melodic i death thought metal subterranean second. was next it is okay. oh i did skip that i'm sorry that's okay that's fine it's an ep so we won't on the podcast, we typically don't talk uh, about EPs, that's but true. Uh, okay. yeah. but we are going to talk about it anyway because we're hypocrites and uh, <laughs> and it's no, so so, so what I liked about in about about Lunar Strain was uh, was Michael Stani's uh, high pitched rasp, um, his just just real intensity. I mean, for a session musician, he seemed really into it. Um, I feel like he had to have had something to do with the lyric writing. Um, but the, the the only issue I have with Lunar Strain is that it sounds like. Um, they tend to start running together after a while. They definitely suffer from the thrash metal Slayer school of thought of, yeah, they're good, but it all kind of runs together at some point. Well, did they, yeah. didn't they lie and said they had like a bunch of songs, but they only had like a few. They had Jack and shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so they, yeah. they just did that because some, somebody heard them, liked them, said, Hey, we want to sign you. How, you know, how much material you got? Oh yeah, we got a shit ton. Yeah. And, and then Jesper, they, they Jesper goes home and is like, <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> we gotta start writing here we now. go. Yeah. Like, let's do this. Hey, what's Michael Stani doing? I think he's, <laughs> I think he's free next week. Okay, great. Let's just do it. Did, no one's going home. Like a band that didn't even really have a singer, you know? And uh, so that, that was huge huge um and i think i think lunar strain is really interesting as a first album because you know it introduces the idea of in flames and that this is a hyper melodic kind of folksy influenced band um that sings about outer space and science fiction and things like that um and i I think it just didn't really fit with what the in flames sound was going to be yeah but I mean, as a debut record, it's great. As a weird side note, the version of Lunar Strength that I bought was uh, actually had a messed up track listing. So like, I would the first song comes on and it's uh, behind space because this was a re-release. And I think it was uh, Candlelight Records that put it out. And uh, that re-release of uh, Lunar Strain has so the first song's behind space like normal but then like track 10 is in the place of track two and then it shifts all the other songs down one so my track listing for that record was completely messed up uh oh, the first weird. time i heard it um it didn't hurt anything though because i think the song that it put in was called clad in shadows which is one of my favorite in flame songs and uh <laughs> So it, it worked out, but yeah, it, it wasn't until a few years later that I actually got to listen to Lunar Strain the way that it was supposed to sound. You yeah. Know? Speaking of the way it was supposed to sound, like, I, I originally did not like this record at all. Um, you know, I don't know what it was, but uh, now that I've listened to it uh, off of uh, Apple Music, because um, I, I think I had a really, like, bad recording of it, um, must have been, you know, low quality. Yeah. Because now that I've listened to it with this, you know, higher quality version, like, I really love this album. It's really punchy, and I can hear everything, whereas it was very, you know, like you said, tinny before. Yeah, it's thin. Yeah. Yeah, very thin. and Kind of like Mortifications Break the Curse. It's a thin-sounding yeah. record. For being a record that was essentially written in a few days, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty uh, damn good for a few days. Oh, my God. Like, And I know they, they had a demo out in 1993, which I think had, uh, what did it have, like, Clad in Shadows and Upon an Oaken Throne and uh, In Flames. Like, they had, like, those three songs. Yeah, because that's all that they had. That's what got them signed. But, yeah, like, the fact that, like, a song like In Space was just literally shat out overnight, like, 
these guys clearly have a lot of talent, you know, and uh, it was really cool to hear it. So um, I think after Lunar Strain did pretty well, they went ahead and, and put out this mini CD, like an EP called Subterranean. And contrary to popular belief, this is not Michael Stani that does uh, vocals on this. It's, uh, oh God, I wish I could remember the guy's last name, but it's uh, Henrik, uh, or no, Henke Force. I think his name is. It's probably Fo- probably Forsey or Farsey. Yeah. Something in, in the anyway, other, the other he's like a he's like a straight up black metal vocalist. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it's weird because when you listen to Subterranean, you might be able to tell yourself that it's Stani singing, but it's actually not. Uh, and yeah. uh, it sounds really similar. I didn't even know. Yeah, until yeah. I started yeah, like it almost sounds like a difference in in, in mixing, then it sounds like a different vocalist. However, Subterranean has incredible material in the sense that it it was a lot better than um, it was a lot better than Lunar Strain production wise. The songwriting wasn't as basic as what you'd heard on Lunar Strain. Um, everything really kind of pieced together in such a way that they really sounded like a more professional outfit than they had sounded on their on their uh, debut album. And uh, I really, I really like Subterranean, just because it really gave us a really good preview of what we were going to get on the Jester race. Yeah, it's starting to move toward that direction. That uh, mm-hmm. you know, with all the melodic elements and everything, getting a little bit, you know, further away from the black metal style sound and into that more Gothenburg right, style. Right. Yeah. You can, this is whenever uh, Jesper starts um, making his mark, pretty much. Oh yeah. Yeah, because this dude wrote everything pretty yeah. much on on all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so he was very uh, prolific in that regard. Now, I guess we ought to ask, are we going to call him Jesper or Jesper? Because I know... I'm going to call him Jesper because I'm from the middle of America and his name starts with a J. <laughs> all right. See, I, I'm a hockey guy and like there's guys in hockey that it's Jesper and they all say Jesper, like Jesper Foss sure. with uh, <laughs> New York you. Rangers, but... So if there's any New York listeners, go Rangers. Right. If you say it, if you say Jesper, you're gonna have to use like some kind of accent. Oh, am I now? Yeah. Okay. So just the fact that I have uh, some sort of Scandinavian, you know, yeah, predatory yeah. doesn't. Let's, let's that bring doesn't... it out. Let's bring it out. <laughs> so here's my next question. <laughs> Much like yes, death, sir? is this another <laughs> example of one man being the influence for one band's sound? Completely. Absolutely. And I don't think you can even question it. Jasper leaves the band later on in their career, and you can tell it's it not definitely even... goes downhill. <laughs> like I like England, but you can tell that there's a difference whenever he takes over as lead guitarist. I mean, I just for sure. Yeah, uh, I mean, I even like Ingle, the you know the, the his you know si- his side project, but man, there's not even a comparison between the two whenever they're writing stuff. I didn't know Jesper left the band. I had no idea. Yes. So oh yeah. I wonder yeah. if I can guess which album. You let's let me see. know oh, yeah, when you I, think it is. When yeah, we, when, when we, we get right, to it, we'll get to it. I'll, I will, ma- I will make my call and see if I get it right. <laughs> and we'll talk about Jesper's uh, new band. Ooh, when the time comes. Yeah. So, uh, Subterranean. <laughs> it's a twenty-minute EP. Has a lot of really good stuff. Uh, if you buy Subterranean right now, you're probably going to get a whole bunch of bonus tracks on it, and uh, they vary in quality greatly. Uh, but there's a demo for a song called "Dead Eternity" on. Uh, on Subterranean, and it's done with the vocalist on Subterranean, and uh, it's it's really our biggest preview for what we're going to encounter on the Gesture Race just a year later. And I think it's interesting that uh, when Gesture Race starts up, that it starts off very different. Like the first two albums, you know, album and EP, they start off very, you know, in your face, you know, like you know what we're about. And then this one starts off very slow, you know, with this, you know, interesting, like not distorted metal guitar. And then it just kicks in and this whole new vocalist pops up and, you know, you're like, this is amazing. This is actually my in flames this is the album that i bought first this is the one that i listened to the most i know it's not the definitive in anybody's book but for me 
this is where it starts and it's like it's it's got the thrash it's got the melody it's got the it starts to shift into that melodic death metal thing that we talked about and it's just solid and it's good it's when it starts to become beautiful and brutal yeah, yeah, they start mixing those two styles in really yeah. heavily. And that's really what drew me to In Flames, because I like the whole dichotomy of having something that's beautiful and just, you know, in your face and brutal all at the same time. I think that's whenever you can you can pull that off, that means you're from Gothenburg, I think. <laughs> it's uh <laughs> it's my favorite In Flames record. And um and the reason is is because yes, it was kind of the beginning. I mean, you can say obviously you know, Lunar Strain and Subterranean was the beginning of In Flames, and you're not wrong, but when you think of In Flames as with the cultural impact that they had, you really find all those roots in the gesture race. Um the melodic guitars, the the um the melodic har- the dual harmonies uh being played, the um the 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 lack of fear of just busting out an acoustic part. Uh, kind of at the drop of a hat and actually making it work in a melodic death metal song. Um, all of that is in the gesture race. Um, favorite song on this record being Dead Eternity is just, I mean, it's just out of the gate, the most intense, brutal thing uh, on that record. And, uh, you know, it really uh, it really cements in flames as a band that, that metal heads are going to take seriously. And um, that they're that they that they at this point are playing on a level that's above a lot of stuff that's out at the time. Lord Hypnos is awesome too. Yeah, as I uh, say, that's actually my favorite yeah, track on yeah. this album. Um, but I think you knew that already. Yeah, Artifacts of the Black Rain. I mean, almost every single song on this record is solid gold. There aren't a lot of stinkers on here. Um, yeah, that's something I can say that, you know, I, there were definitely songs I skipped on the first two, mm-hmm. and this one, you know, I can just put in and listen to straight through. Um, it's yeah. just a good, solid album, and yeah, it's it's very enjoyable to listen to, yeah. especially when you get a version that is unlike the one I first heard, which was a very terrible quality. Right. I think the first thing I heard on this was a cassette that Dan found somewhere at some music festival, and then... Three days later, I find the CD, and I'm like, I'll buy that. Sure, it sounded good, and it was way better. But yeah, I think it was a, actually it was the a, reissue. It was a sampler uh, that I found. Yeah, it, it wasn't the full album, but it had like four or five tracks on it. It was on cassette, which is really weird. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, they uh, they really killed it on this one. I mean, I think I think nobody really expected that kind of a shift, and this was where they finally had cemented their permanent vocalist position with uh, Anders Frieden, yeah. who... Um, unlike Michael Stani, actually uh, had a very unique approach. I mean, Stani's a great vocalist, and I, I'll never, I'll never talk trash on what he did in Dark Tranquility because it's it's awesome and I love him. But uh, I don't think his voice was right for In Flames. I think uh, In Flames, it, with embodying that more melodic, I mean, almost mainstream sound, I think Anders had a voice that was, you know, equal parts. Um, brutal, but also like kind of relatable. Like I don't. It's almost like he had almost a little bit more of a hardcore edge to his screams. Yeah. That um, that Michael Stani didn't have, which his screaming seemed more rooted in in black metal than than in uh, than in death metal vocals. And so uh, I think I think Andrews really sounded good here, and um, he really he really kind of became the face of the band. Uh, really well. I think once you heard Gesture Race, there was no looking back. You yeah. Know, like, and this you, is great. You can even tell, like, that, um, you know, there was a shifting of the guard here, too, because the first, uh, you know, th- two, three albums all had that same, like, you know, uh, like, I don't even know how to describe it, but the, the logo looked at, was drawn a certain way. And then the gesture head, man. Yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it had that, you know, it was red and white outlines and, you know, it was all skew a little bit, and then they go to you know a totally different uh, style of writing their name out, right? Uh, more like just typography instead of like artwork. Sure, yeah, and, I get it. Yeah. yeah, it blows my mind that in 1996, this band really started to sound modern. The way they play their guitars, the way they write their drum parts, the way the vocals 
play off the riffs. You would hear more bands do this 10 years from now. Right, yeah. And they were already doing it. Yeah. yeah like, I, I mean, it, it's crazy to think that, like, uh, you know, the epitome of awesome at that time was, like, whatever Metallica was putting out. Or Pantera. Or Pantera, yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, for all we knew, they were doing this kind of crazy stuff. Sure. You know, for, uh, that we had no hey, idea. Man, it's, going, it's going across the sea. Nobody has internet, you know. Like, yeah. Nobody knows. And it's weird, too, how in Europe, you know, uh, metal is, uh, you know, like extreme metal is way more accepted than it is in the United States. Yeah, I mean, you have giant festivals that, like, you know, uh, what, Amon Marth plays at, and it's just a giant sea of people, and you wouldn't get that here. It's just right. a dive bar with, like, 40 people in it. Right, yeah. We're four of the 40. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Maybe. I gotta get I gotta get my beauty rest so I can go to work in the morning. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> one thing that's really Fuck notable. That, call in the next day. <laughs> one thing that's really notable about the gesture race is the uh, the focus on um, kind of interstellar, um, like spacey lyrics, science fictiony lyrics that deal with uh, almost kind of Lovecraftian topics. Um, well, that's part of the reason why I I liked him so much. I didn't want to hear about. Satan, you know, and shit like that. Yeah, they didn't do that. You know, yeah, it was very. Yeah. Um, they never really talked about religion or, or because you know a lot of the bands. You know, I always say religion. And I don't mean like Christian groups. I mean like bands that talk about Satanism or like, but not like real Satanism, but like the whole. It's the opposite of whatever the church teaches, so it's satanic. All that stuff is annoying. This stuff was very original, and uh, and I really love that about about In Flames is that. You know, I was going to be singing about science. I was going to be hearing about science fiction, you know, types of topics, and that would actually follow the band uh, quite a while. Um, they they kind of always stuck with that motive. Um, so, Jester Race being such a huge album for them, you know, where are they going to go next? And you know, it was uh, it was they they ended up putting out probably the. Uh, blueprint for how to be melodic death metal after that which was their album Oracle yeah which is only a year later which makes you also wonder like how many songs that they have written for Jester Race and right. these were maybe like Jester Race B-sides that they beefed up and rewrote, rewrote Tall Flow into this album uh, you know because it's also a super solid album and it's only a year later and most bands don't do that Right. Well, remember they wrote Lunar Strain like over a weekend, right? That's so, true. You know, uh, it's 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 a testament to how well they are actually able to craft songs. So, you give them a year, that might be all they need. And yeah. I'm that guy in the crowd that says your your metal band sounds generic. It sounds like As I Lay Dying. What you actually sound like is In Flames, 1997, Horacle. That As I Lay Dying would go on to rip off less than a decade later. Oh yeah, but I mean, these are those riffs. This is that that sound that we associate with melodic death metal. This is it. For sure. And everybody ripped it off. And I mean everybody. As yep. I lay dying, kill switch engage. Dan, keep me going here. Uh huh. What War of Ages? War of Ages. <laughs> Avenge Sevenfold Avenged to an Sevenfold extent. Avenge Sevenfold in like, the early years. Everybody ripped this off. Everybody played this style. Um, I, th I think it was. Uh, there, there weren't a lot of bands that didn't have that. Yeah. Like that was all. Uh, it was all from In Flames, and uh, it's just really weird because how is it that we consider a lot of that stuff to be derivative crap, but we think In Flames is really good. Um, and I think what it really comes down to is In Flames had a theme. They had an idea that they followed through with. Um, you take that theme out of the music and you're just left with empty notes. Yeah. And uh, Horacle had an atmosphere to it, you know, where you really felt like you were part of something bigger than yourself. And there's this whole, there's this space theme and this this prophecy and lyrics that I don't even completely understand myself uh, half the time. Speaking of not understanding, like, you know, we talk about all this space stuff. And then they come out with episode 666. Right, yeah. <laughs> Which you'd think would be like, okay, this is our generic satanic metal song. And like, 
has nothing to do with the title of the song at all. Yeah. Like, it's just, hey, guys, this is episode 666, so uh, here you go. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What I really loved about this record, too, is it was the first In Flames cover song that I'd heard, which was uh, their cover of Everything Counts, uh, which was done really, really well. Yeah, I was surprised. I When I was a kid, I was a huge Depeche Mode fan, so. Yeah. Hearing that, I was like, I was like, wow. So, what I like now, which is in flames, with what I loved when I was a kid, I'm like, that's funny. I had no idea that that was a cover song. It's so good. Yeah, I snuck one by him. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. This actually has one of my uh, favorite songs on it too, "The Hive." I love that song. Oh, "The Hive" is great. Yeah, Um, I really love on this album. um, um, Shoot, what was that song called? "Dialogue with the Stars." That's one of my favorites. Um, it starts off with Jotun, which is uh, kind of got that uh, Nordic uh, <laughs> sound to it. Um, Nordic influence, you know. They're from they're from uh, they're from Scandinavia, so like you're hearing you're hearing a lot of that uh, a lot of that Scandinavian stuff in there, like with, yeah. the, with the folkish melodies. I, I, I mostly hear very... the folkish rhythms. Yeah, when I yeah. listen to those yeah. bands. Well, they make them so metal because I, you know you hear a lot of like modern quote folk metal bands, right? And like they they have all the old folk instruments on there, and they've got metal on the background, which usually sounds like screeching cats being drowned, <laughs> and it just never really sounds that great. Um, In Flames played you know um, folk inspired riffs. And they, they played metal songs that had folk influences, but it sounded good. It sounded metal, you know? Yeah, like, I mean, this one right here that we're listening to, Dialogue with the Stars, um, there it just has that undertone, Yeah, but it still, you know, is very metal and modern sounding. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, it just, this one just clicked with me so, so much. And this is 97. Right, this is a long time ago, you know? Yeah. This is 30 years ago, right? No, 20. dude. 20. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> Oh my twenty yeah. God, where has time gone? I'm getting Dude. old, man. But yeah, it's twenty years old and uh I just can't even get over it, you know, uh how good it is. I still listen to Horacle and it still sounds like a new record. You know, it doesn't it doesn't sound like a nineties record. Yeah. Now, this sounds like mid two thousands melodic death metal. Melodic yeah, death metal or even metal core, you know, whatever you want to call it. No breakdowns in this, you know. <laughs> but uh you know, it's uh a lot better solos, a lot better leads, a lot better yeah. everything. I mean, now we're talking '99 with Colony, right? And this is starting the triumvirate of my favorite three, which yeah. is Colony, and then Clayman, and Reroute to Remain. Ah, and these are my my three faves. All right, uh, and I just I just can't get Let's enough. Let's dig of into these that, three. buddy. Yeah, I love these <laughs> albums. It probably is a bias though, because I think when I my first album was Reroute to Remain. And then I picked up immediately after Clayman and Colony. Right. So it's probably a little bit of a bias in that these were the first three I sure. you know, dove yeah, into. Absolutely. Yeah. That was your that was your blueprint. So that's yeah. what exactly. Which and, there's nothing wrong with that because I mean Clayman was was mine. So I, I totally get it. Yeah. Cause I know Clayman has probably one of my favorites, but we'll get to that when we get there. Yeah, but absolutely. Um I mean these first three tracks on Colony, right now we're listening to Embody the Invisible and then Ordinary Story and Scorn. Uh, you know, and I mean, in Colony, God, I can't even the whole album, but uh, they just all stand out. They have this like feel to them. They're super fast. Yeah, and you know, I mean, then we play Paller's Andrews Visa, which huh. is just this like random melodic interlude to just give you a break. <laughs> so if you want to be a yeah. jerk, go listen to the song Zombie Inc. by In Flames, and then go listen to the song Zombie Autopilot by Unearth. And uh, let me know what you find. They um, sound very similar. <laughs> not very similar. They're like the same the thing. thing. Yeah. yeah. This is what happens when you rip off one band with your riffs. You know, they kind of created a style that if you rip it off, your only choice is to rip it off. Right. Like, you can't play that style of melodic metal or melodic death metal without straight up ripping it off. You know what, though? I'm starting to think it wasn't Zombie Inc. I think it was a different song. You have to let me know if you remember which one. It wasn't Colony. You know what I'm talking about, though, right, buddy, though? That there was a... I remember listening to Zombie Autopilot. I 
it might have been just the name. Yeah. Because we got them confused a bunch. Yeah. Because we well, got like, we'll, both of them at the same time. Yeah. yeah we'll find it when we get yeah. there. <laughs> Under un- Unearth was kind of uh, one of the chief offenders of of stealing riffs directly from In Flames. I mean, like directly. <laughs> and uh, you know, one thing that was different about Colony is there was a uh, kind of more of a keyboard presence on the record. Yes. And uh, everybody ripped that off too. Right. Yeah. Eventually, everybody did keyboards as well. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so there were keyboards on this one, uh, a little bit more programming, almost kind of like an electronic feel in places, um, which would be explored much more heavily on the Clayman release yeah. that yeah. came out right which, after. But I mean, I feel like like having the keyboards is extremely, you know, um, important to the sound of the band. Yeah. Uh, I mean, again, because I'm biased and I started with when they introduced the keyboards, but I mean, they kept them in for a long time. And oh, yeah. it just adds this layer of atmosphere that is just undeniable in its listenability and catch, you know, just catchiness. Yeah, I mean, the keyboards worked really well in Colony, and Colony was um, what I would consider to be the last uh, epic record by In Flames. I see, that's where we uh, disagree. I said <laughs> epic, I didn't say good or bad. I, I still I think just they had said some epic, epic stuff in, to come. Well, epic songs, but an epic album as a whole, I would say that Colony is kind of the last record that's tied to like a, you know, an overall concept. Okay. And let's talk about keyboards and metal real quick, Dan, because a lot of people have asked the question, should there be keyboards in metal? Absolutely. And I have always said, keyboards in metal started where everything started. They started with rock bands using orchestras. Sure. Keyboards were just a more efficient way of adding that ambience. Yeah, that atmosphere. That's what you're looking for. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So, yeah, I can get on stage with two guitars, a bass, and a drummer, and the heaviest vocalist you got, and I can be heavy. But if I'm being musical, and I use a keyboard to add some ambience to my music, there's nothing wrong with that. And there's a lot of bands that did the same thing that a lot of people would call heavier, falsely, like hardcore bands and sure. metalcore bands. But it was always, you're always ripping it off. And there was a time period where modern bands were cheating and using, Corn would be a great example of a band that used the guitar to create that ambient sound. Oh, yeah. But good orchestration always has some type of ambience, at least in my experience. So where does the keyboard sit? Right on stage next to the drummers from where I'm sitting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the keyboards were, were huge within Flames, and I think it really added to that epic feel of the records. And um, a- after a while, it ended up even shifting more into an electronic-type feeling. Yeah, I mean, uh, even, when, even when we started our own band, uh, I you know specifically requested that we get keys yeah. because of In Flames, like because I wanted... To sound, right. you know, as bad as this sounds, I wanted to sound exactly like In Flames. Yeah, we you didn't because yeah, our we guitarist. Totally didn't. We, ended up sound, <laughs> we, ended, we ended up sounding more like Under Oath than anything else. Um, yeah, and uh, but uh, Clayman contains probably one of my favorite uh, In Flames songs, uh, which is Square Nothing. Mm-hmm. And I, don't, I, I think it's just because I love the uh, build up of it because it's very like slow and then it just kind of like folksy yeah and it it punches you part of the way and just like it it teases like, you it teases oh, you yeah. Yeah. yeah and then all of a sudden it just kicks in and just annihilates you for the rest of the song yeah it's you know? it's actually my favorite song on the album too so. the chorus is great yeah it's yeah, yeah it's amazing i love i just love the way the chorus is with you know um Oh man, I gotta look up the lyrics now because I don't want to get them wrong. Because <laughs> I'm always like, in the moment, I can sing them, you know, when I'm listening to it. Yeah, like, spend some quality time with the demon of mine. He said, I like this way you struggle, but you know I'm, you know here, I'm to here to win. You know I'm here to win, yeah. I'm just like, oh, that's just. Yeah. <laughs> and In Flames lyrics were always a little weird, uh, especially on the early albums, because I don't know. If it was a language barrier or what, but uh, their lyrics are actually a little rapey. Uh, like, there's that word and, again. Yeah, well, like in um, in Jotun, he describes it raping the Statue of Liberty, and then in another song in Satellites and Astronauts, he says uh, 
just randomly out of nowhere. It has nothing to do with the song at all, but he's just like, but think, because I rape your mother. You know, yeah, that's it's brush just, the dust away. Yeah, it's, uh, is it brush the dust so he says that? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was satellite and, uh, satellites and astronauts. Yeah, I, I just um, scrolled into it on Dark yeah. Lyrics. But yeah, it's uh, it's just, it's weird, you know. Um, it kind of comes out of nowhere. But uh, so Clayman is extremely notable in the sense that it was the first In Flames album that featured hints of what we would get later. Um, Anders actually sings a bit on Clayman. Yeah. And this is the uh, last piece of what would later be really, really ripped off, is that melodic singing. Yeah, I mean, like, so he starts off singing. Very first song. Yeah, the, the, the one nice thing, though, is that there's a... Uh, it's not completely clean, and but he has a little bit of help. Yeah. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's clearly there's clearly a lot of um, of help, yeah. Uh, <laughs> At least they're not layering them 70 times over. Right, that, that would come later. Um, <laughs> but uh, he sounds cool on Pinball Map, where he just kind of, like, shouts... Yeah. You know, guided by the pinball map, you know. You know, it's funny cuz I hate that song. That's the oh. that's the only pin, that's the only in flame song I just can't stand to listen to. Oh, Is I there- love it, man. The intro's the intro of that song is pure in flames. Oh yeah, I love that. But then when he gets into the chorus, I just can't stand the way he says the chorus line. Guided Not- by the pinball, pinball map. map. Yeah. It is. It's a little weird. And wasn't it, that their um that's their first video too, wasn't it? Yeah, and this was this was the first uh this was the first in Flames albums where Metalhead started to say you know, like they're selling out or whatever, you know, like they, they they're starting to to add melodic singing to their sound. Uh and it was really kind of one of those weird things where I don't hear it. Like I hear Music that is the, the the logical continuation of Colony, you know. Yeah. I don't think it sounds um, not metal. I think it still sounds very much like melodic death metal for the most part, and I don't really have a problem with it. You know, um, I like the way that record sounds. Now, but you can you can hear the beginning of what I like to call the In Flames Choir on this on this record. Um, I think the song uh, "Only for the Week" has a has a kind of a melodic kind of has a melodic chorus to it, and they kind of followed that through that where it was kind of a mixture of like Anders death metal vocals with kind of this background choirish sound. And um, see, I don't mind the layers that much. Personally. I don't mind it either. I like the way it sounds on this. I mean, it it sounds great. The whole record is is a very well produced product. Which, for whatever reason, turned off metalheads. You know, at this point, you hear people being like, "They've sucked ever since the Jester race." Yeah, and that's stupid, absurd. That's it absurd. is. I would Absolutely. say absurd. I mean, if you just, I mean, if you just like metal in general, how can you not like this? Well, yeah, in pure <laughs> pure opinion here, but uh, is Clayman or even Colony as good a record as the Jester race? I'm gonna say no. I'm going to say the Jester Ace did have better riffs, had better song structures, had better solos. Uh, however, this album is more that catchy. doesn't that doesn't yeah it doesn't invalidate what came later, and um, that's that's a very important thing to say this early in their career because I feel like really all the way up until about 2008, everything they put out was solid gold. Yeah, and nothing ever takes away any of these old albums, so. Even when bands go on later, which we'll get to, you know, they don't sound quite as awesome. Um, yeah. You know, the old albums are still there. You could still pop them in and listen to them, and they're still amazing. They're still readily available. I just bought uh, Lunar Strain, uh, The Jester Race, and Horacle all on vinyl. You know, Very hun- nice. 180 gram vinyl, and they sound great, and I love them. And yeah, you're supposed to bring nobody, those over to my house. Remember? Nobody can ever, nobody can ever take those away from me. You know, they're oh, great. Yeah, except you're gonna forget them at my house. I mean, if you show them, <laughs> over, I guess. I guess if you show up at my house with a, <laughs> yeah, here, take them. Um, but uh, you know, uh, Clayman, I think got a pass for the most part. I think people were like, well, they're starting to move more into the mainstream sound. But it's still good. It's still metal. It still yeah, works out. Definitely. I think I think a reasonable person is not going to have much of a problem with the Clay Man. But when Reroute to Remain comes out in 2002, well, there was some shit talked. 
Yeah, I <laughs> yeah, can see some people. Having I was one problems. of those people. I. Really? Three Rats Remain just, yeah, it was kind of, it was a dip for me, man. I didn't dig it as much as, I guess, everybody else in the room. Oh, <laughs> man, I this was my jam. I, I love this album. I, it, it's, this it, is it, Jeff's it, last episode. Uh, yeah, apparently. <laughs> this is the, seriously, this is the first album that I actually felt compelled to skip every once in a while. You know, like songs on it that I was like, okay, I want to go to this, but now I want to skip that. Dude, how can you not listen to Trigger? I'm not and, saying that that was one that I skipped. Say. <laughs> but see, so this is different though, right? Because 2002, right? Isn't Kill Switch Engage already a thing now? Uh, this is when Kill Switch Engage became a thing. This yes. is when this is when everybody stopped giving a shit about new metal, and right, everybody right. wanted to hear heavier stuff. You know, people yeah. wanted to hear. You know, all of a sudden you started hearing names thrown out like In Flames and. Dark Tranquility and Opeth and um, Scar Symmetry and bands like that. I could be wrong about Scar Symmetry, but um, kind of of that that same ilk where people wanted to hear stuff that was just you know it wasn't like you know your Slipknots and Mud Veins and Il Ninos and stuff that we talked about last time. And, we we uh, wanted to hear music again. Just say it. We wanted to hear music We wanted again. to hear heavy metal songs with solos and, you know. Yeah. Um, we didn't want to hear Image, if you want to go back to our, we didn't our want to last hear, episode. Right. We, we didn't we want to hear about Tough Guy. Tough Guy and then what everybody looked like. Even if, you know, the music wasn't the same, everybody looked the same and had right. the same attitude in, in new metal. And right. we were yeah. happily over it. Buddy, do you remember the first thing I said when I heard Trigger for the first time? Um... I said, no. I hear Dio in this band. Oh, yeah, I do. Later that. on, before Kill Switch Engage would go to cover Dio, I'm listening to In Flames with Buddy. I'm hearing Trigger, and I'm like, I hear Dio in this band. Heavy metal was coming back. It never went away. It right. will never go away. Yeah, that traditional heavy metal sound. I mean, a lot of people describe In Flames as a combination of if, like, like if Iron Maiden was death metal. You know, like, yeah, and it's a, it's a very well, valid. Sometimes I'd go with that. Yeah, it's a very valid argument. You know, there's a lot of similarities to Iron Maiden, especially in early in Flames. And um, so I'm gonna make everybody suffer now. All right, here we go. Okay, <laughs> because this song has been trigger is what we're listening to. This has been forever ruined by my own brain. Uh, when we were, I bought this at Best Buy, right? And so I've popped it in, and we're listening to this, and I'm just joking around with Dan. And that line in the chorus is, from green to red, I paint the sky. And I somehow heard one day, from green to red, I paint Best Buy. <laughs> and I've never been able to not hear it Secret. ever again. Secretly, I, I have the same problem. <laughs> <laughs> ah, nice. <laughs> I have trained myself not to hear it that way, and uh, I'm happier for it. Um, what about that song in Soul Embrace where he says I farted? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> that will never go away. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Doomhammer. <laughs> There's also, uh, what is it? It's that same song. There's another one where it sounds like he says, but like my but, left butt cheek. Yeah, yeah. my butt cheek. <laughs> yeah, right. um, extreme metal vocals you can have so much fun with. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there was, uh, or not even, even in Zayo. Um, oh, what's that song? Uh, I'll, I'll have to I'll have to pull that up later, but it sounds like he says I farted. Um, <laughs> yeah. I can't remember what is it. <laughs> we're, we're collapsing into fart yeah, jokes, ladies and gentlemen. I can't gentlemen. remember which uh, can't remember which album that was, uh, what song it was, but uh, uh, anyway, there. Right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> but um, Rear to Remain was interesting in the sense that um, so people that were that were firmly rooted in metal, people that had kind of had reservations about Clayman. They didn't have anything to any good anything good to say about Rear to Remain because there's a lot more singing on this record. The In Flames choir uh, returns, but not only is there a choir at this point, but Anders is singing. Yeah, and there's also one Solo. of the, the one of the worst covers that I think of. Yeah, we can't talk about Rear to Remain without talking about their cover of the song Land of Confusion. That is a steaming pile, in my opinion. I'm, I'm going to take this next five seconds to say sorry to everybody that is not only a Genesis fan, but like myself, was very happy when Disturbed chose to cover Land of Confusion. 
This I've is one of those this. cases where I will say that Disturbed... Well, you never heard what? Land of Confusion. Disturbed did a much By better who? cover of... Uh, I think anybody. This song. Oh, seriously? Yeah. Oh. I've never heard yeah, this. Yeah, the... Uh, my, my copy the... ends at uh, Black and White. Oh. You're a lucky man. <laughs> yes, because this is... This is shit, man. Is this like on a reissue or something? Uh, like, um, I think I it just depended on which version of the album you bought. Cause I don't know, because I bought this when it first came out. So yeah, This is on the reissue. Okay, that's probably the problem. This is a steaming pile of garbage. What is this a cover of? This is a Genesis song Land called of Land of Confusion. Confusion. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was great back in the day because the music video for, uh, for the Genesis version had uh, uh, Thunderbirds looking characters just, on it. Just listen it was, to it. It's horrible. What's happening? It's, don't, don't ask. <laughs> it's, it's really bad. Especially if you know the original. And actually, yes, Disturbed did a really good this job. This is the only time I'm ever going to say this, but Disturbed did a better job than In Flames on something. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, Much like I heard Dio in In Flames, I heard Genesis in Disturbed long before they ever touched that song. So when they did it, I was very happy. I was like, there it is. Right. But... So We're people, talking about In Flames tonight. So people let's, talk yeah, a lot of trash on Reroot to Remain because of the singing. The singing on the non-cover songs is fantastic, um, yeah. I think. And Anders sounds good. And to quote Jeff for the Clayman stuff, it's clear he had a lot of help. <laughs> yes, he <laughs> did. Uh, they had a good producer, I guess, that just made him do it so many times until it sounded good or, or whatever. Or they there maybe there have been some digital mani- manipulation. I'm not sure. I, I think there is... Uh, some manipulation, I'd I, have to say. I'm gonna put a I'm gonna put a date on it. Um, so Auto Tune kind of became a thing professionally right around 2002. Yeah. So yeah, but I, I think it still sounds good. It, on, it, on, they, on, yeah, it hadn't been taken to, to where it would be taken later. But yeah, like, it was still there. I mean, I think it sounds good uh, on here. And I don't really have an issue with it unless you're just the kind of person that's like no clean singing ever, which, you know, that's more Buddy, which is kind of funny because he likes this one so much. Yeah. But, well, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of backed off on that. I went through yeah. a phase where I, did, I didn't like do any screaming at all, and then it was just nothing but screaming, and then now I've kind of leveled out and, right. you know. So. so I think most of the claims that, you know, in flames went new metal on re to Remain are, are just are bullshit. You know, I think they're not really valid arguments about it's like okay, they're singing, there's a little bit of electronic element. Okay, sure I get it. But I don't think that, that this record was bad. I think it's very redeemable in a lot of ways. Yeah. And for people like us, it was our first introduction to in flames, so it, it made us seek out those earlier records and, yeah. and you know, we, we grew we grew a very nice appreciation for that band yeah, uh, I mean, based on what we heard here. It's, again, still my favorite album, you know, and so I, I can't hate on uh, Reboot to Remain at all because every time I've listened to In Flames, that's the first thing I pull up. Now, they follow that up with an album called Soundtrack to Your Escape. I'm going to duck while Dan goes off. I know no. you're out to try me. Yeah, yeah. okay, so oh, in this one, the new metal comparisons might be a little uh, founded. Yeah. I think somebody on I think on somebody on Amazon <laughs> summed it up very well. Whenever he said that the clean singing on this record sounds like Jonathan Davis from Corn is singing but randomly being stabbed by a hot poker. <laughs> <laughs> Did you in fact well, write that review? No, I did not. Okay. I wish you could take credit for it. I would, but I, I can't. Uh, you see, I guess I'm going to be a contrarian because stabbing with the hot poker some more because I actually I like this album a lot. I do too. I actually, actually do as well. Yeah, like it's just I like some the f- of the uh, lyrical bits, you know, like the I know you're out to try me on The Quiet Place Yeah, uh, is a bit just weird for me. But Yeah, you know, see, I, I don't. When it comes to In Flames, I don't. I guess because some of the earlier stuff, their their lyrics are so weird as shit. I just, I don't really pay attention to their lyrics. Yeah. Okay, I, so I, I, well, I, I guess because it was just starting to dive into like that whole like high schoolish, you know, like very. I don't know. Like I don't know how to describe what I'm trying to say here. They were kind of emotional, personal lyrics, which yeah. I wasn't used to within Flames. I'm like, why the hell aren't they singing about space? You know, uh, and so there's a song on this record called "The Search for I," 
And I think the most cringeworthy so moment. Try. Yeah, so the most cringeworthy moment on this album is when he's like, but I am ready to give you the M. It might even be the E as I begin the search for I. The eye is lost in me. Like, I don't know. It just doesn't sound sincere. It sounds really <laughs> it like... It sounds like a, a, a little play on words. Yeah. It's like the kind of lyrics I would have wrote when I was in a notebook when I was 13 years old. But, all right, Anders, you need to be a little bit more personable with people. So. To be fair, this is pre-emo. But emo uh, was on the way. No, not really. No, emo was like emo Sunny Day Real Estate in, yeah. in like 1994 yeah, with emo, emo had existed since the late 80s. No, so. no, 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 no. I don't mean real emo. Do you mean screamo? I mean what we had to deal with for mean, five years. You mean whiny little bitches? Yeah. So, there you okay. go. And Anders, <laughs> Anders really becomes that. He he becomes a torchbearer for the whiny little bitch movement um, on this record. I know, um, like, well, I mean, I even, I, I really like this song. But that makes sense because when you have like like you better dead, you know, because he's talking about how this house is not my home. Well, if it's your house, why, well, just uh, kick them out. Yeah, life, it's your house. <laughs> yeah, like like you better dead. Uh, they have a song on here called "Evil in a Closet." I just I can't. You know, this this is whenever I first kind of started thinking like, okay. Maybe this isn't my in flames, you know, not my in flames hashtag, you know, like I, it was just, um, yeah, it was I, different. It, it didn't sound like, yeah, well, there's a lot of people that say that about this album and I, I'm going to give them kudos. Cause I, I like the fact that they're, they're stepping out and trying new shit. At least to them, it's new. I yeah. mean, I like this record, but there were a lot of warning signs <laughs> on come, it that, yeah, yeah. that you, maybe you, you I wasn't right. going to be as on board. Uh, after that, <laughs> I think for me, this was like, like, there's a difference between like an album and a collection of songs. And I think for this one, this was like a collection of songs and there were some good songs on this album, but then there's some that I'm just yeah, like, there, eh. there are a couple that you're just, you're right. That are just, eh. yeah, the, I could skip them. But like this song, every time I put this album on, I love to listen to like you better dead. And, um, what was the next one after that? I think it was My Sweet Shadow and yeah, I, I do I like, like Evil in a Closet. That one is still pretty my good. My Sweet yeah, Shadow is good. Was, yeah, uh, the I first really song, like my sweet uh, shadow Fiend, a lot. Friend, or whatever it's called. Yeah, uh, uh, that's that's <laughs> probably one of my favorite songs on the record because it is well, like opens up so brutal. Right. Yeah. Right. It's the first time you hear the you know like type of vocal on an In Flames record, and uh, but I mean at this point they're not playing melodic death metal anymore. You know they're playing. They're playing kind of what everyone else was playing at that time, yeah. which was like that metalcore, almost ripping off of their own band kind of uh, and it's, kind of sound. It's funny because if you listen to uh, Just a Race and then listen to soundtrack right, you know, immediately, um, then you you can hear that difference. But if you start listening from soundtrack or uh, you know from Just a Race and then one at a time, working it's, progressive. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a lot more gradual to see that shift. They shift into it, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, did In Flames become a parody of themselves at this point? I think so, but I think it was still such a good parody that you might not notice the difference right away. Okay. Um, or even if you did, I don't think you cared. I think if you liked Reroute to Remain, you were going to like Soundtrack to Your Escape, which we yeah. did. You know, uh, there was no real uh, to me. There was no issue at the time. As I, as I'm a little bit older and I appreciate stuff like the Jester Race more. Um, my opinion on it has shifted, but when it first came out, I mean, I was jamming this shit in my car every day, you know, I thought, oh yeah, it's in flames. It's great. And people would be like, well, well, doesn't this sound like, uh, kill switch engage or doesn't this sound like actually like dying? And I'd be like, no, you need to go back and do your metal yeah. history because this was the original, you know, I think these yeah, are the I, guys I, that did it first. I know? think I like this album also partly because there's a lot of harmonizing vocals. And i like, we talked about the, uh, the in flames choir, Oh yeah, a yeah, lot of that. I, there's yeah. a whole lot of that on this album, and I think they do a really good job of it on this one. Yeah, it, I can't get past the guitar sound on this though. It it got this well, was, that was what I was gonna bring up was yeah. that it kind of has this like almost vacuum sound, uh, like it's vacuum. It's very, that's a good song. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, when the uh, yeah they actually have a song called Vacuum on this record, but no, no, it's no, not it's on, on this on one. the next record. Oh, is it on the next one? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's it's on uh, Come Clarity, isn't it? But uh, so soundtrack to your escape though. Every time the distortion kicks in on the guitars, it sounds like 
Like you're trying to listen to this album on your headphones and your mom's like vacuuming, you know, <laughs> around you while you're while you're listening and uh it I think bothers I, me I, a lot. I know it was around this time, I don't remember if it's exactly this album or not, but they actually had mentioned they specifically started trying to play guitar parts where they could actually play it live. Mm. Because apparently they were having That's interesting. Yeah, they were actually having difficulties replicating the sound. Uh, for performances off their early albums. That's what happens when you have two guitarists and 17 parts. Right. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I remember watching a uh, documentary on uh, Between the Buried and Me recording uh, The Great Misdirect, and I'm watching the drummer just try constantly to get this drum part you know, on one of these songs, and I'm thinking, oh, how are you going to do that live? He's like, blah, 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 blah. oh and, my God. Yeah, yeah, and he like throws his sticks, and he's like, how am I doing this? And the answer is he's Blake Richardson, and he could do no wrong. Yeah, uh, that's true. But, oh. So at this point, In Flames, I think their contract had ended with a uh, nuclear blast. And uh, in America, their stuff was picked up by uh, an al- a uh, record label called Fair Records. Which was the same that uh, got picked up with uh, Zayo. It was Zayo, right. Absolutely. And, so, um, and us, us, obviously, um, as we mentioned on every episode, are humongous Zayo fans. And uh, <laughs> who, who is that? Get out of my house. <laughs> Go listen to episode three. <laughs> Just... I don't know what to... I don't, I don't really know how to respond to that. So, uh, 2006. Anyway, 2006, Dude. Come Clarity come hits. Come Clarity. And I, I'm going to admit, this might be one of my favorite albums. I I fucking love this album. It, it probably has my two favorite songs on it, actually. So, so which are your two favorite? Go ahead. Well, Vacuum is... Easily my favorite song. I'm going to go get a beer while you guys talk about this. <laughs> okay. Enjoy your beer. I will. Keep talking. Well, I had so, to wait for Dan to get by me, and Crawling Through Knives is the other. Crawling Through Knives and Vacuum. Yeah. yeah. I really like uh, probably the first four the most on this album. I yeah, I like the, the one with the, the, the chick. Yeah. yeah she, I, they, I don't remember if they've ever had another... Uh, like a guest vocalist type, you know, singer no, uh, on they, their they, albums. They, yeah, I don't think I they think ever have. Right. At least not a girl, that's for sure. No, no, they did on, um, shit, one of the early ones with one of the folksy songs. They, Dan, do you remember which one, which uh, album had the uh I the always female? thought that was Anders. Anders is the dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Because, I mean, we, listening we, we, to this record, I kind of don't get that impression. <laughs> oh. God damn, dude. Dang, this is when this is when Dan's teeth come out. Yeah, and he, I, he's gonna get he's gonna get. I knew he was gonna get pissy as soon as I said I actually really do enjoy this album. I know I'm I'm still on board with In Flames at this point, but Dan yeah, this, is starting this is to where it, uh, come off the rails here. Yeah, I, I had I got one more album after this, and then that's whenever I come off. But I really do like, and I, I think it happens to do with the fact that I I fucking love Vacuum. I love this fucking song. Okay, so I like Crawl Through Knives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do too. That's my other favorite song. And that's about it. But like, okay, oh. so all the shit that everybody talked on Soundtrack to Your Escape and Re-Ritter Clay Man and Rewrite to Remain, all 100% confirmed slash verified here. <laughs> okay, it's not new metal. <laughs> we know that. But like Joe asked earlier, at what point does the band become a parody of themselves? Oh, it's totally on. That this, is that's totally okay. this record, totally. And it's it's fine because you want to say, yeah, okay, yeah, it's still heavy. Yeah, it's still heavy, man. It's still good. It's still great. It's not great. Okay, this band, you know, goes from talking about space. You know, there's a purpose and a result behind all human apprehension, the shrieking silence, and the blackness of space. That stuff is super metal. It's super awesome. Um, raping the Statue of Liberty, I guess, is metal, too. I'm not entirely certain. I have not tried that action. <laughs> However, I will tell you that it sounds a hell of a lot more metal than Don't want to live in a dream all day. I mean, it doesn't sound good. It sounds actually like emo singing, which is very strange, coming from an In Flames record. Although it doesn't become very strange, it becomes the beginning of a trend. And um, mm-hmm. I kind of saw the writing on the wall with this album, and I was like, "Dude, I'm done. I'm just done. I can't, I can't get into it." I remember at one point, you know, um, 
buddy even it's like, Dan, did you even li- really listen to Come Clarity? And I'm like, yeah, I listened to it two times. And then I was done. <laughs> I can't. I can't get to this point. It sounds like modern metalcore. It sounded like all the other bands that were on Ferret Records at that time, with the exception of Zao, because they can do no wrong. However, <laughs> um, they were just, I mean, it, it was just so, uh, it was so lame in places, and it just, I couldn't, I was. I definitely became one of those people that was like, it's not my Inflames. <laughs> and I think this was the point where I essentially checked out on Inflames. Yeah, that's okay. I mean, I still enjoyed them. Yeah, I was I, still down with it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the only problem I had with this record for me was that I felt like after track four, the tracks kind of, um, they didn't have a distinct sound to each of them. I felt like they kind of, you know, I, you got lost in them. They, they didn't, you couldn't tell when one started, they, they ran into each other. As well. Dude, did you watch like the it. video for Come Clarity? No. I wasn't. I was only on board so much. And I just, <laughs> he was listening to the record. He wasn't watching the performance. That is true. Dan is shaking his head at me right now. Yeah, well, I got nothing to say other than it's just. Uh, well, come clarity. If I would have watched the video, I would have not been on board with this. Is that what you're it's, saying? It's weak. <laughs> it's so weak. Well, okay. Let's put it in perspective. The only video that I've ever watched by them was Cloud Connected. I started and stopped with that one. It's weak. <laughs> I'm not even trying to be a dick, you know, it's just, <laughs> but I guess one of my requirements for it being metal is that it not be not metal. <laughs> so it just didn't, I don't know, man. Uh, this was the beginning of a downward spiral for the band. It was a big missed opportunity, a big sidestep. And it, they probably sold tons of records to 13-year-old girls that were just like, yeah, oh, and I my was God. One of those, I was one I'm, of those 13-year-old girls in I'm the training, listening, bro. I'm I fucking listening, loved it. I'm, I'm listening to melodic to death metal. <laughs> I'm listening to death metal, Mom. Isn't that so just crazy? You know, like, <laughs> I just, I can't. I just can't. So, yeah, you got leeches sitting right next to uh So what do Harry. you think about a sense of purpose? Well, obviously, we th- we already fucking know what Dan thinks. He thinks it's a big old fucking pile of shit. Let's put it this way, man. I feel like shit, but at least I feel something. <laughs> well, and I don't even remember what what was the track on here where he just like completely gives Anders just gives up and just busts into like a flat out whine. I think it was like what track or, seven? I think. Uh, it was no, on soundtrack okay. to your escape. No, it's no, on. I'm, isn't it on the it's highway? On this one. No, it's not on the highway. What is well, it I'm then? gonna pull it up. Let's see if I can find sober that, and irrelevant. Maybe. Yeah, I think it might have been sober and irrelevant. Ooh, that's a good one. It's a good, good title. Or maybe it's move through me. No, it's the chosen pessimist. So in other words, it's we the chosen a, pessimist. We got a bunch of shit that we think that he's the, he's he's whining a whole lot on <laughs> on on this album. Yeah, because he's all like he he just gets super whiny on this song. It's not his fault. It's the song's fault. I mean. Uh, I'm about to ask the question, what was In Flames thinking? Or were they just trying so hard to keep up with what was popular at the time? Because for those of us that chose to forget, you know, the timeline of 2006 through 2010, this is when the whining happened. This is when Under Oath did an emo record. They did that back in 2004, homie. You're right, but But it, it still existed. They came out with it, and then In Flames heard it, and then were like, hey, we should do that, because it sold a lot. I'm going to ask the question, who thought this was a good idea? And why do we give them money and studio time to make it happen? Say all your, say all your good well, stuff. Well, it's because first. he just, he said it earlier, it's to sell it to 13-year-old girls. That's I mean, pretty much what you can say about it, because... I mean, they sold a shit ton. I mean, I mean, it worked. You got to pay the bills sometimes, I guess. I don't know. Which is basically why you make a popular record. So is, yeah, you want to make money, you got to eat popular? too. Isn't, well, is it, it popular it, 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 on its own? Is it popular because the sense of purpose is a great record? Or is it popular because everybody liked Come Clarity and everybody liked Soundtrack to Your Escape and, and, and Reroute to Before That? Do you think... Reroute to think, Before That? Do you think that... Do you think there were... <laughs> Do you think that there were people that listened to this and were like, this is great, let's do it? 
Well, I mean, I, I don't I mean, know. Who was like? Who was like? You know what? This is the next big in flames record. Because somebody somebody thought that somebody in the somebody in the quality control department was like, "This is good." So, so well, let's you know, it's do the same this. Thing. Oh, I, I'm gonna kind of hit a little bit of a, a punk note on it, but I mean, the exact same thing happened to a band that I really enjoyed, which was AFI. I like their early shit is fucking Agreed. phenomenal, one hundred percent. Yeah, and then it just was like, "What the fuck are you thinking?" We and were they, thinking that Miss Murder was a good idea. Somebody and, 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 it, and apparently it was for them because it, it became their highest selling album. I think if, if we go back and we look at the quantity of what was sold when this when this uh, album came out, this was In Flames' highest selling album. So I mean, it, sure, I mean, th- there's money involved in this shit. I mean, I get it, but I don't. Even I can't defend this one. I'm Once, getting pissed wh- off just hearing it on the headphones. But okay, so <laughs> all right, well, all right oh, look, Dan t- t- is t- the t- chosen pessimist. Th- th- then put March to the Shore on. That's a little bit better. Yeah, March to the Shore was. I'm a little pretty sure it the only get way better from it, here, Jeff. Oh, here we go. No, March to the Shore is not that bad. It's it's towards the end. Not that bad is not a good descriptor <laughs> for anything. No, this one's actually pretty good. It's all right. I don't think there's a song on this album that I can point to and go, hey, I like this it one. It sounds very inflamesy. Like, a Drenched in Fear, March to the Shore, and The Mirror's Truth. That's about it. I've listened to this album so little that I can't even remember what any of these sound like except for the Chosen Festival. At this no, point, no, no, this one's actually... I don't know. This is more like, you know, the mid... At this point, we're, we're, we're at parody, though. Yeah. Gone are the dual guitar harmonies. Well, I already told you why they did that. I mean, that that was a a money making thing so they could play it live. Okay, that makes me feel better. So they're shitty players too. So just throw it on there. <laughs> hey, at least. Well, at this I, point, you know what? This. It probably it probably is. Well, does Jesper just, 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 just not know how is, to like? Well, I mean, this this is Jesper's last album. The dude was fucked up. Shocker. He was heavily into alcohol, was drunk all the fucking time. I'm heavily into alcohol, and I still know what metal is. Yeah, but he had to <laughs> like, fucking play it, and obviously he couldn't pull it off. I mean, he, he had to leave because it, it, his problems were so bad. I mean, they were, like, worried about the dude. They didn't even know if he was going to make it. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, it, it was serious. So, yeah, yeah I mean, whenever you, you're the guy that's writing all your music... Who's the man who's driving your band is having problems? There's a good chance that your music is going to be reflective. That makes a lot of sense now. So you put out this turd, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> you have to own I, that. It's, it's not, <laughs> but it's okay. It, this All one's your other this is not a turd, salad, right? So this one's okay. not a turd. This one's a fart. <laughs> it's okay. We're, we're getting. We're, we're getting, not a full blown turd. We're yet. getting to the we're, turd, uh, um, dude. We're getting like explosive diarrhea. Okay. Actually. <laughs> okay. So, but it's fine, right? Because all your stuff's rock solid up to this point. Yeah, I mean, even this one. You guys had a misstep. Everybody has it. Everybody puts out that album. Slayer put out uh, Diabolus in Musica. You know, Metallica put out Saint Anger. Corn put out. The path of totality. Oh, dude, dude, I love happens. my dubstep. Yeah, <laughs> no, actually, it's my, it's my, it's my kid. I'm just you know fucking what? with you. Know you. What? you know what? <laughs> it happens. I, I said it once. I will not repeat it. Oh, you, you said it. Yeah, g- yeah. Get out of your house. I know. I understand. <laughs> it happens. Okay, everybody, everybody does it. The greatest bands in the world put on an album. The people are like, "What the hell is what that? What the hell were they thinking?" Med- Megadeth put out Risk. Ooh, um, yeah. Oh. You know, because I'm already pissed off, so let's talk about risk. No, but uh, <laughs> no, man. Hey, go back <laughs> that to that episode. Already exists. Yeah, so, that was that was epic. So okay, everybody has that album. Okay, great. What else you guys got? Uh, hey, now we ha- now we have steaming pile of shit coming. Wait, your new album's called Sounds of a Playground Fading. What the hell so, does that even mean? Well, you know what that means is their music isn't fun anymore. For those that, yeah, that that's it's a been a few it. weeks, it's been a few weeks. For those that have been a subscriber, three, two, one. Mm-hmm. 
And I'm going to now duck because Dan has a microphone. <laughs> and an empty beer bottle in his hand. He's going <laughs> to fucking destroy, destroy you for playing it. Oh, God. What the fuck were they thinking? Well, okay. So. Money. Let's, let's stay positive here. I haven't heard the rest of this yet. I mean, I'm just I'm just pretending right now, but it's this is starting out like, you know, they're doing the they're doing a little melodic buddy, intro. Buddy, you know, maybe it'll dude, come back. Don't, don't, buddy, don't, even don't, even don't. at your best, man, you you can't pretend. No, I can't. We love you, buddy, but come that on. you man. haven't come on. heard this already. They can't deliver us from this. Yeah, uh, I, I did do that. That was a fucking pun. Nice. <laughs> I did do that. <laughs> <laughs> They're trying. I, shall no. we move on, or yeah, I mean, shall we continue? They're not even the same band. Yeah, this is like a completely different band at this point. It, and it really is, because the driving force is gone. This is the first album without Jesper, or Jesper, however you want to say it. And it's depressing. I mean, it's really depressing. Okay, so that, that first riff really hits you like a pile of bricks. You know, like a pile of paper mache bricks that, you know... <laughs> that you play with as a, as a small child because they're afraid that if they drop one on your fucking toe that it might hurt you a little bit. But there's nothing about this record that hurts you. There's nothing about this record that, that, that cuts you or makes you feel convicted or gives you that feeling in your balls that you're listening to something that's, that, that's heavy, that's rebellious, that's against the system. There's nothing on sounds of the playgrounds of a playground fading that make any sense from a metal perspective whatsoever. And yet, at the same time, this is coming from assholes that were supposed to be the the uh, you know pioneers of melodic death metal. Heavy emphasis on the death metal. None of that shit exists here. This is this is um, insulting to me as a metal fan. I can't get behind it. I can't. I just it's. I tried. I can't, it's not even a guilty pleasure, as I've said many times before. If you want to make pop music, fine, make pop music, but make good pop music. Don't give me this halfway shit of like, okay, yeah, so we're in flames, right? So did you guys hear that? It sounded a little bit, uh, a little bit folksy. It sounded like in flames. We're still doing the same shit that we did before. It was the same problem with Mortification. You know, they put out they put out records that are like supposed to be death metal, but they're fake death metal. Okay, it's not even it's not even the same thing. Okay, it's just it's it's um it's this like. I, I don't know. Like, are you? Do you not even like? Do you not play these old songs live? Do you not remember like what you sounded like? Do you remember? Do you remember playing all those complicated guitar parts? And you're like, yeah, dude. I mean, at this point in my life, in 2011, it's basically just like 1996. It's the same shit. And I think everybody that was a fan of the band up to this point is gonna really love it. They're not. It's bullshit. Hey, Dan. Dan, tell us how you really feel. <laughs> I can't hold it anymore. Ladies I, and you gentlemen, know what? we don't have to say <laughs> another fucking word because Dan said it for all of us. <laughs> Did you just wow? The that final was boss? amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I tried listening to this album multiple times because I wanted to like it because it was in flames. I listen to Saint Anger a lot too. And it says in I, 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 on the cover. I couldn't get. <laughs> I still that. have yet to listen cover to cover. I have not been able to go from the first song to the last song straight through without having to take a break or skip a song. Oh, good God. I wish I could say that. Jeff, cr critical listener question, okay? Yes. If you, in a hypothetical existence, had no idea who In Flames was, I wouldn't even fucking listen to it. If you picked this record up, would you at least have gotten through it? Absolutely not. I, I would not have made the attempt. I would have said, fuck this shit. It sucks ass. What would you have listened to in spite of it? Dirt Tranquility. Actually, it makes me want to go listen to Catatonia, to be truthful with you. because Okay. And, I mean, and here's, here's, the way, here's the reason why. It's because they're a band that like did the whole 180... And they did it right because they, they did it good. It. They yeah, absolutely, it. absolutely. They didn't do like Dan said this half-ass shit. They went and said, "You know what? Fuck you guys. 
this is what we want to play, and we're going to do it, and we're going to own it, and you're going to love it. And I still love Catatonia, and I still love In Flames, but for different reasons. I love In Flames because I have the old albums I get to go back to. Whenever Catatonia comes out with a new album, I'm like, all right, I can listen to this. This is good. I cannot say the same thing for the last three albums for In Flames. And it starts with this. This was trash. Yeah, like, okay, so remember when I said that I had only watched one music video? Well, I I told a tall tale. Because now I remember that they could have put out a video for Deliver Us. But I used the word tall in the same sentences. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really short. <laughs> I'm trying to puff myself up a little here. Yeah. <laughs> keep but, it going, keep it going. So, okay, like... Did they have to play into the playground theme? Because on Deliver Us in the music video, they're on a Ferris wheel for some reason. Is Anders fucking Benjamin Button? <laughs> like, <laughs> did he start off as like a, a, a mature, you know, like, did he, did he start off as like a mature man that had deep thoughts about the universe and existence and things like that? And then you get li- later on to the end of their career and he's talking about being on a fucking playground when he's seven years old. I mean, is that it? Is that Anders? Is that where we're at? Jesus. Apparently. (laughs) At least we win. Dan has won. Yes, he has. And we have two albums to go. (laughs) And they follow this up with... I, I Okay, even when I saw the name of this album, I was like, okay, I knew that this isn't gonna be good because it's called Siren... Charms. Is that like Lucky Charms? Is there like marshmallows in there? I mean, I mean, uh, that means there's crunchy parts in there too, though, like in Lucky Charms, right? No, because oh. a charm is, you oh. know, you're trying to be all like, you know, inviting, right? But this isn't inviting to a metal fan. Siren Charms has says nothing. I mean, maybe if it was like that means they siren... fucking they fucking tricked you is what it means. Yes. I mean, why can't it be like s- Siren Death? S- Did they trick you? Just put because out screen bloody gore again. To- Okay. No, I didn't so, listen no. to... You know what? I, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I didn't even give this one a chance. I was so pissed off. I didn't even fucking listen to a single fucking song on this because I was so pissed off. I said... I, I, I can't even express my anger. I was so angry. I so. listened to this one time through. Oh, that's better than me. Yeah, yeah you're you're a glutton for punishment. That's all I can say. Well, I was working at the time, so it was easy to like drown it out oh, you when know it what? wasn't screaming. You know, <laughs> and there was I, I'm nothing a, if, that... if I'm working, I gotta listen to something good. Otherwise, I might want to kill myself. <laughs> so yeah, fuck that. I was not gonna listen to this when I was at work. Well, I enjoy my work, so it was okay. I could, I could punish myself a little bit. Oh, I like my work too. But oh, there you go. <laughs> but I, I don't remember a single screaming part on this record at all. Is like, there one? I don't think there is. Do they scream at all, Joe? You know, it's not about the screaming. It, oh, it totally is. No, it's not for me. It's not. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't mind. I don't. I don't. I don't, mind get, I don't get pissed off when I listen to an Iron Maiden record and there's no on it. You know, if it was on there, I'd be like, "Whoa, whoa what?" You know, but like, yeah, that's it's not about that. Like I, like I've said that was many the early times stuff before, before, Bruce got on board. Here's the thing: Paul if, Diano did not screech like a dying calf. No, he didn't. Okay, Bruce Dickinson was just like, "I think I could sing better than this guy." And they're like, "Oh wow, yeah, okay, he can." So, uh, see ya. Yeah, but uh. Not about the screaming. As I've said many times in this podcast, if you want to make pop music, that's fine. Everybody likes pop music, right? On some level. Sure. Make good pop music. Don't make this shit. <laughs> because no, if like, you're making pop music, this doesn't, you better be hot. And I better have hey, a music Anders, video. I, you know, I would. And probably, I better have the mutant button. I would probably. And then I'm good. Anders, you know, I mean, you know, so he's a good-looking guy. As a fan, <laughs> so I'm flame. not even listening to In Flames right now. What the? F- I don't know what I'm listening to, but it's not In Flames. No, it's not because Jesper is In Flames. But what if In Flames? That's right. Covered Shakira's "These Hips Don't Lie." Would you listen then? It's a good Just pop song. So Anders' yeah. hips don't lie. I don't know yeah, though. I, I don't know out though. Out of curiosity, I would I would check it out. <laughs> Just to see. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know though. Is it going to be a good cover or is it going to be like Land of Confusion? Mm, good question. Oh. Probably Land of Confusion. Now that no, I've heard it. no, because they covered Everything Counts, but they were still a badass band then. I, I, I'm dying to hear how we're going to get through battles at this point, Dan. Mm, battles. 
the last album. Truly, it is the end. They tried, I think, to bring it back to I need 2009, some... 2008 ish. I only need for, some, for a couple I need of songs. Some nicotine to get through this. Okay. There's only a couple songs they tried that on, and it just didn't work. On my way here, and I listened, like the first couple songs I think are, like, are tolerable, and then it just goes into mushy shit. I mean, I mean, we already had our explosive diarrhea. That was Siren Charms. <laughs> it, it, and now we have like those, you know, those little stinky little farts with the little Hershey squirts you get after your explosive diarrhea. That's battles. <laughs> you are setting a new tone here, Jeff. Well, I think it's shit. What else can I say? Go online, try to find a bad review for battles. I know. Are Go you ahead. serious? Does it Go not ahead. Exist? We'll wait. Do no? Are there no bad reviews for this album? There's a few. There's a few. Did Most you write like them? I didn't write any of them, dude. I do this podcast. I don't have to write. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, actually, so, technically, if we hit the right level on our uh, Patreon, I think you will be. That is true. Okay, if if we make fifteen dollars per month on our Patreon, <laughs> Dan will I, begin write, blogging. I will write a full review of the last three In Flames albums, all at the same time meaning or three separate. To, meaning, reviews? I'm going to take my valuable time out of my day <laughs> and listen to this stuff, <laughs> and I'm going to tell you exactly what the truth is about every single one of them. That's a, that's a guarantee, you know. I know it's not because there's a song called The Truth on Battles, but the thing is... Why is there a song called In My Room? Because you're in his room, because he's a, an infant at this point. He's, <laughs> he's Benjamin Button. We've gone all the way back now to birth. So at this point, we're literally changing Andrew's shitty diapers. <laughs> I wanted okay. to like this oh. album so bad when I heard it come out. You know, it's not as bad as Siren Charms. Yeah, I don't however, think that's physically possible. However, okay, so they scream more on it, right? But the music still sounds like this this fake cookie cutter wanna sound like in flames. Like it's like if we started a band tomorrow and we're like, we wanna be sound we wanna sound just like in flames, but we also want chicks to check out our music. And yeah. again, that's a really sexist term because there are lots of women that listen to fantastic music and like my um, wife. Right, there there's no um Hey, my wife like ins- likes and sing. I'm not saying. <laughs> see, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying like you know. I don't know. Like, I could actually probably get her to listen to this, but I don't. I don't want to come across as sexist because I don't. I, that's not what I mean. I, I just You're mean, a pig. Like, I think. I think even the girliest of Valley girls could listen to this and be like, "Dude, this guy's a pansy." Like, <laughs> would fans of The Offspring listen to this record? No. The answer no. is no, because The Offspring is an amazing band, and this is I don't know what. I can't even put a finger on what this even Didn't sounds like Didn't they win like a anymore. bunch of fucking awards on this album, too? It's almost like... It's almost Why? like... Uh, I don't know. Again, it's it's like the whole mortification thing. There's like all this hand-holding going on. Like, like it's so bad that people just feel bad saying that it's bad. Like, they don't want to be the ones to be like, hey, buddy. Uh... <laughs> You should probably put in the towel. This is now. my least favorite thing to do around here, but uh, you're you're terrible, <laughs> ladies I mean, and gentlemen. Dan is about to be that guy. I mean, the shit that you're putting out is. And if I could address the band directly, which don't get me wrong, Anders, if you want to come on the show and talk with us about your favorite band, that would be. Um, <laughs> yeah, would be I, I can ideal, tell you right so. now who uh, Anders' favorite band's gonna be. So if you're it, well, okay. So if you're if if Anders, if you're listening, okay. I don't, I don't hate you. I guess hate's a strong word. Do did you did you wrong me? Did you make me feel bad? Yes, you did. <laughs> but <laughs> I feel like I feel like we can we can forge a new relationship together as friends. And I think that I think we can go off into the future in a rainbow unicorn type fashion. And I think it, I think it's going to be all good, and I and, I, and I'm, I'm down for the interview. I want I want to do the interview. I want to talk to you. I want to I want to talk about how the gesture race changed my life, and I want to talk about how Horacle was fantastic. And I want to talk. I don't want to talk about anything that happened between 2016 and 2006, and I'm I'm willing to let that stuff go. So it's on you as to whether you want to let that stuff go. 
I'm 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 totally fine. But if you want to talk, I'm I'm here, man. You see, I'm all down for the breakup. I'm here for you. No. See, I, I'm breaking up with Anders, and I'm going to go out with Jesper because he's got a new band. Him and Peter Ivers. Super Iwers. stoked about that. Yeah. And I can't fucking wait to hear it. And it's, I don't know exactly how it's pronounced. I think it's Syra or Syra. It's uh, C-Y-H-R-A. Who cares? It has to be great. Yeah, but <laughs> the, exi- the exciting thing is that uh, Jesper has been pretty much clean and sober for a while now. Good deal. And I'm hoping that we get some of that old magic back because I'm I hoping think, in two years. Yeah, because he's the, the he's the driving force. <laughs> he's the reason why we liked In Flames. Yeah, let's I, channel it, the absolutely, man. absolutely. At the end of the day, he's the reason why we did. I mean. Anders is a great front man, great vocalist. Dude, give me four soundtracks after soundtrack, and I'm still on board. Yeah, we all are. Yeah. Even if, you know... That's all I'm asking. I'm not asking for Horacle Part 2. I'm not asking for the Dresser Race. Well, I'm, I'm asking for it, but if I don't get it, I'm still good with soundtrack instead. Sure. I'd like another reverb to remain. And that's fine, too. But I'm, I'm biased on that one. That's fine, too. I, I, I have no issue with that. I I, do, I don't. And how like you know uh, the, the e- whole e- even it, to to make Dan. Yeah, never Dan's mind. I, I, never, I, right never, never, I I think I, I think I don't I don't want to reignite the powder keg. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna call it here and say starting with Buddy. Final thoughts on In Flames. In Flames is a fantastic band. They've definitely shaped uh like metal for the past twenty plus years. And I mean, if you're if you want to check out anything by them, I mean, you're not going to go wrong with anything before 2006. Um, all those albums are super fantastic, but you know there are people out there that like this newer stuff. If that's you, great, that's that's your bag. But for me, everything you know, uh, soundtrack to your escape and before that's that stuff's amazing. Jeff, it's uh, it's kind of like a high school girlfriend. Where everything is just fucking awesome in the beginning. Things are just, you know, peachy keen. You're in it. You love it. There's all that emotion. And as time goes on, it kind of gets contrived. Things get stale. And then you start wondering, why the fuck am I still with this person? And then that's whenever they become your high school sweetheart that you still talk about 20 years down the road. Because... They're not the same person that you had a huge crush on in high school. They are now their own person, and it's definitely not who you are compatible with. And for me, that's what happened with In Flames. I love them. I love that memory and because you always have that first love from high school, and that's what In Flames is for me. They are my first love. Uh, but if I met my first love from high school now, there's no way in hell that the two of us would ever get along. Now, I, I wouldn't. I could never see me spending the rest of my life with her, and probably vice versa. So that's kind of how I equate it. Is you know they're my high school love, and, and, and it'll probably always stay that way. Dan, <laughs> yeah, follow that up. <laughs> He's gonna just go fucking psycho. Okay, guys, Anders, buddy. Not Anders, buddy, <laughs> but Anders, my buddy. <laughs> As opposed to this buddy. Th- this buddy is my buddy. Uh, so, okay. <laughs> y- you listen to Metallica, right? You listen to Iron Maiden, right? Do what they're doing, man. Put out something that doesn't sound that different than what made you popular before. Tour on those old... <laughs> albums play play just erase in its entirety play Oracle in its entirety on tours randomly don't tell anybody you're going to do it get this huge buzz off of the fact that back in the day you were the definitive melodic death metal band and just cash the check Bro, just just do it. Just just make all this money on reprinting <laughs> Horacle t-shirts and make all the money on printing Colony t-shirts. The artwork on Colony is great. I mean, just great. 
why not put that on a t-shirt and sell it to people and cash the fucking check? Just do it. It's going to be great. And I think everybody's going to respect you and they're going to be willing to look past the last four albums. I think it's going to be fine, man. So my, my message is, is, is directly, my message is directly to Anders in that look, man, you have the potential to still cash the check. You have the potential to make all the money. So just do that and just make it awesome. Make us forget all about your sins. Make us forget all about your personal feelings. It's not that I don't care about your personal feelings. I'm sure you're a great guy. And like I said, I'm really down to do the interview. But my God, man, like just just stop with the whole I'm going to sell stuff to your girlfriend and not to you because I'm the guy that bought your records. I'm the guy that stuck with you. I'm the guy that said that sounds isn't that bad. But again, I was still trying to sell it to my girlfriend. I mean, come on, man. Let's just, let's just cut the shit and get to the real stuff because I know you've got it. You don't need Jesper. He can, he's going to do a band. It's going to be great. But you're the fucking lead singer of In Flames, okay? You have the potential to be so much more than you've been. So let's do it, man. I'm gonna help you. You call me. You call me up. <laughs> we'll make it awesome together. We'll have a good conversation. We'll be good friends. And I respect you. And I'm disappointed. And I'm upset. I'm not mad at you. I'm disappointed. So let's uh, let's step it up, man. God, that's like the worst thing you can do. That's like the that's the dad talk. <laughs> You'd much rather your your dad go, "I'm gonna fucking kick your ass." But if you do the, that may have been I'm what I was like on a sense you. of purpose. But you know, <laughs> um, but I've you know I've I'm a dad, so I know how to I know how to handle these type of situations. Dan, okay. What is so your album of the week, man? What is your album of the week? Shit. Um, you are doing yourself a disservice if your album of the week is not Anti Melody by American Standards. Jeff? All right, I'm going to go a little proggy here and I'm going to go uh, Tesseract, Altered State. I've been listening to a lot of that lately. Oh, that's good. It's <laughs> so good. Go ahead, buddy. Yeah, What's it's, yours? It's, yeah, it's so I've been listening to an EP by this band called Nothing Left called Destroy and Rebuild. Well, that's so good, too. I know. It's such good hardcore. The vocals are so acidic. <laughs> like, <laughs> I love it. It's so heavy. And I have been faithfully listening to Norma Jean this week. I know I already called out Polar Similar once, so I'm going to cheat and say... Everybody needs to listen to the anti mother, keeping in the theme of anti go. in our in our uh, album of the week theme here. I so, pretend that one doesn't exist. Yeah, but we're Norma Jean, right? So we're gonna put out a grunge record, and it's gonna be a great grunge record because we understand that people might walk away from us, and that's fine. But again, if you're gonna put out music that's not the norm, at least be good at it. And on that note, this has been episode 16 of Discography Discussion. Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play, iTunes, and Stitcher. Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things Discography Discussion, including our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash discuss metal and please send questions and comments to dan and joe show at gmail.com god help you if you have not subscribed to this podcast and we will see you guys next week i'm your chosen pessimist the preacher of sin Get out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> Explosive diarrhea. That's all I gotta say. Oh, yeah. And more beer for Dan. <laughs>